My name is Terry Sunderland. I'm the European Sales Manager for Speedex, and today I'm going to talk about how you can go beyond detection using novel qPCR technologies. It'll help if I have this slide changer. Um, a little bit about Speedex. We are really new here in Europe. We've only just opened our European headquarters in London in June this year. But if you go back to where we came from, we actually started as a research division or group within Johnson & Johnson's R&D department in Australia. As a result of the global financial crisis, J&J ceased all external uh, development or R&D uh, R&D programs outside of the United States. And the, our founders actually convinced them to allow them to allow J&J to take let us take our core technology core technologies and develop them. Now, we spent a number of years developing them further, and we entered some uh, licensing agreements with Illumina and BioLine, and most interestingly, with Biocartis. Now, you may have seen in GenWeb last week, they have this Idilla platform, which is a fantastic cartridge system, that they have these three uh, kits for oncology, which can detect uh, 90, 98 mutations. In one of them, there is a 26-plex multiplex. And this is how big it is. It's a sample to answer um, cartridge. If you look on the side of it, it says SpeedX Technologies. Now, f uh, after that, we actually started working with a group in Melbourne, a sexual health group, and we realized that there's some challenges around antimicrobial resistance of a particular organism, and that there was application for our technology. And that's where we realized we could actually start bringing our technology and selling it directly to customers. And so we have two kits at the moment. But what we have is two core technologies. One is Plex PCR and the second is Resistance Plus. Plex PCR gives you more pathogens per test, while Resistance Plus gives you antimicrobial resistance status. This occurs in a single qPCR assay and it can allow you to get rapid information to enable effective antimicrobial tech, uh, treatment. Now this is a PCR, it's a new PCR. I've got three slides that are a bit technical, but it won't take long. Within the assay you have a target gene. This is your choice and we'll say it's a bacteria. We have a forward and reverse primer and a, sig a signal probe. Now the signal probe looks like it's similar to a TAC man. It has a fluorophore and a quencher. But we also have these two DNA oligos, which we call partzymes. This assay will run on a normal qPCR platform that you probably have in your diagnostic lab today. Now as the thermocycle goes through its cycling process, we get extension of the template. But then at the annealing phase, phase we have the two part signs join together to create a plex sign. This ha has an enzymatic activity which specifically cleaves a DNA sequence which is within the signal probe. Now this is a enzymatic process which there is no actual protein involved with it. This is DNA which is capable of cleaving DNA. And what's interesting about it is the cleavage event is separate from the cycling of the PCR and extension of the polymerase. So you can actually have more than one uh, signaling, so fluorescent signal event per cycle, which gives you a highly specific and extremely sensitive uh, assay. I'm now going to move on to Plex Prime. Now this is the technology that enables the antimicrobial detection. What we have is, this is your template which has a single nucleotide polymorphism or mutation. We have a standard reverse primer and a forward primer which matches the mutation. It then has a single base mismatch and then we have an insert. Now this insert is mismatched to the target. It can be maybe five bases, it might be 50 bases, it depends on that target. But what it does do is it increases the specificity and it differs for every mutant, enabling the determination of clustered mutants, which I'll show you in a second. But if you then put this into a, into a thermocycler, you get amplification from that Plex Primer, you'll get a Plex Prime Amplicon, which contains the insert, 
the mismatch, and the mutation of interest. Now, if we add, in this, this is all in the same assay, it's the same reaction, the plexime, what we get is mutation-specific detection. We get cleavage by the activity of the plexime, of the uh, signal probe, which gives you your fluorescent signal. And what we have is mutation-specific amplification and mutation-specific detection. This is all in a single assay. Now, we have resistance plus, and this is actually the, the product that we would actually uh, put to market, where you have multiple mutations. Again, this all occurs in a single assay. We can stack our plex primers to look at cluster mutations, which are very difficult to uh, distinguish using a standard TACMAN technology. Now, this bit gets a bit busy, but during an amplification of those three plex primers, we can have three separate amplicons generated, to which we can have three separate plexines. Each one can generate a signal either on a different probe or we can stack these into single channels to give a single readout. Now, this all occurs in a single qPCR well. This is really powerful multiplex technology. But what it does allow us to do is to develop our assays quite quickly. So if we look at the Plex Prime, Plex Zyme technologies together, we have a signal probe. This signal probe, the sequence is removed from your target sequence. And actually, we just have a highly characterized library. We have 30, 40 probes that we put into all of our assays. We know how they behave together. We look at the Plexime. We have a conserved binding sequence for a specific signal probe. The Plexime itself is conserved. Then it's only this targeting uh, region, which has to be specific to your specific target. Um, all of this occurs in a single assay. It's a really robust detection system. And it's actually quite cost effective to implement because there is no specialized technology, or no specialized uh, equipment that is required. It'll run on standard qPCR equipment, which is most likely in your diagnostic lab. All right, that's enough of technology. What I want to do is give you a case study. So we're going to look at mycoplasma genitalium. This in the UK was recognized as, in a, as an STI the end of 2015. And I like to quote quality news sources. So the Daily Mail has indicated there's hundreds of thousands of people who have got this STI, but luckily the Independent also picked it up. Now, a little bit about it. It's highly prevalent. It's about two and a half times higher than gonorrhea. Um, treatment has been mostly syndromic with azithromycin. Um, but as a result of this treatment, there's around about a 40% resistance rate being detected. But what we have is a brand new STI, which is already resistant to that first line treatment. What does it actually do? Well, if we look at the general population, it's, it's in about 1% to 3.3% of people. The exact disease burden is unknown. Um, these epidemiological studies are just beginning or under, are underway. But in men, we know it is highly associated with NGU, proctitis, ballantitis, chronic prostatitis. And in women, it's associated with cervicitis, endometriosis, PID, and preterm birth. The implication of having MG is really quite significant to the patient. How do we treat it? Well, because we don't really test for it routinely, and most gum clinics in the UK don't test for MG today, um, you would appear with NGU or cervicitis, and you'd be given, say, doxycycline or azithromycin, generally as a first-line treatment. Doxy has a poor cure rate. It's uh, 30 to 40%. If you look at azithromycin, it was quite effective. A one gram cure, a one gram dose would give you an 85% cure rate. There's also moxifloxacin. This is commonly used as a second line treatment, 
although it does have increased toxicity of the patient, um, and there's a significant increased cost compared to either azithromycin or doxycycline. As I mentioned previously, we're seeing um, increased resistance to the first-line treatment azithromycin. And this resistance is associated with, these are all single nucleotide polymorphisms. There's five that have been published that are the most common. If we step back for a second and say, well, what does resistance look like globally? The US, it's over 40%, same in Australia and New Zealand. If we look at the UK, it's about 41%. If we go to Greenland, it's 100%. I mean, this is a brand new STI, or we've recognised it as an STI. We already have quite high resistance rates. And interestingly, the IUSTIC guidelines, which have just been published for both NGU management and for MG, both recommend if you're going to test for MG, you should also test for macrolide resistance. So what does testing currently look like? Well, MG, it's a bacteria. You should be able to grow it. Well, it's actually really difficult to grow. It um, takes around about six months from a single inoculum, which is completely impractical for diagnostics. There is molecular detection tests available. There are a number of qPCR tests which are either in-house or there are some CE label ones which have been recently made available. But if you want to start looking at macrolide resistance and the uh, 23S mutations, you have to look at sequencing, FRET or high-res melts. These are all very complex to implement in a standard laboratory environment. They require highly skilled technicians and they're expensive. But what we do need is a rapid nucleic acid amplification test which provides both detection and resistance. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. We have resistance plus MG. This is a single qPCR, qPCR well assay. It both detects MG and it will determine the presence of any one of those five SNPs that confer macrolide resistance. What does the test look like? Well, it's really quite simple. We have, in a single well, we have three channels or three separate probes. The first, we get detection of MGen. The second, we've stacked the five reactions that could give you the SNP. So as a, for a clinical decision to be made, if any of these come back as positive, your patient has MG, which is macrolide resistance. And we have an internal control. Performance-wise, well, sensitivity for MG detection is over 96%. Resistant markers are over 97%. Specificity is 100% and over 93% collectively. It's a single well assay. It's really quick. We have multiple specimen types. And because we know that people like the hologic system within sexual health, we are validating for use with the Aptima transport system. So we don't have to change the practice within the clinic of how they collect samples and they don't have to collect an additional sample. What you get is in a single assay, um, both detection and determination of macrolide resistance. So if you look at the comparison of if you just implement a detection of MG compared to a macrolide resistance. So we'll use an example which is a patient presents with symptomatic urethritis. They would either get azithromycin or doxycycline, depending on your clinic. You test for CT, NG, MG. At three weeks, you do a test of cure, or there'd be failure. Then you'd administer a second-line treatment. MG is a slow-growing organism. Um, if you administer doxycycline, and with that 30 to 40% um, cure rate, with such a low cure rate, doxycycline can actually re reduce the bacterial load which means that the patient, patient doesn't return for that test of cure because they think they're cured. They think they're fine. They reappear another three, six weeks later. So what we had is people walking around with a macrolide-resistant MG spreading it in the community. But if we take this same situation and apply a test which includes macrolide resistance, what we get is that person still, their clinic experience doesn't change but they get a call back, and that might be two days later, where they are administered a second line treatment. Now this removes that MG from the community, 
and it's also in line with the IUCD management guidelines, um, you get improved patient outcome and reduced spread of antimicrobial resistant MG. Now, this is in line with the O'Neill report, intervention five. This, this is what we're saying we should be doing here. Um, but I'm going to talk about fluoroquinolones for a second. I mentioned moxifloxacin. It's the second line treatment. At the moment, we already have 15% resistance in Australia. There are reported cases here in the UK. Again, it's SNPs, which are conferring the resistance. What we have is a new STI, which is resistant to not only first line treatment, but also second line. In development, we already have, this is in clinical development, we have a test for MG fluoroquinolone resistance, where we're working with the Royal Women's Hospital. Um, and this is where I'm coming back to rapid assay development, or our ability to do that. And if we look at us as a company, what we're aiming to do, we, we don't just do sexual health. So we also are looking at mycoplasma and pneumonia. Now, macrolide resistance here is everything from China, which is anything up to 100%. Australia, it's quite low. But here in Europe, it's growing. So at the moment, we have about 9% in the UK. Again, we have a test which is already in clinical evaluation, which looks at macrolide resistance. Mycoplasma, mycoplasma pneumoniae. So looking forward, we have two core technologies, the Resistant Plus and the Plex PCR. Resistance Plus, this is what we're looking, we are developing, which specifically addresses the challenge of identifying antimicrobial resistant bacteria. But we also have Plex PCR, which assists with determining when you should be using or administering an antimicrobial. And we have some really interesting, um, this one here, this is going to be an excellent, this gonorrhea is going to be absolutely amazing. It's a very simple, multi-antimicrobial resistant test. Um, and we have R&D versions that are available, so we are looking for collaborators. So, my name's Terry Sunderland. That's my email address if you require anything. It's a .com.au because we're an Australian company. I'd like to thank you all for your time and if you have any questions.